do. All right, you guys. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, I'm joined with my, my girlies here, Angie and Nicole. This is part two of our soul story and our reincarnation. I, I created a whole new playlist because I felt like usually I do diff, you know, part one, part two different weeks like next but i wanted to go ahead and start part two this week because i think our part one was so powerful what do you guys think oh my gosh yeah. duh mm, yeah crying <laughs> i had a lot of good feedback a lot of and a lot of people that were um really really resonating with those messages that came into telegram for support you know and they the overwhelming um message was you know i finally found my people you know like this is what i've been going through and nobody around me is either receptive of having a, even a conversation about it or i say it and they look at me like i have five heads you know it's just that this is the same thing that we all deal with you know where we awaken and we realize our truth from our soul and no one can tell you it's not true. Like, you know, when you, mm -hmm. when your soul recognizes true, you know, it, 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 yeah. it is not wavering, but it certainly helps when you have like hearted people to say, you know, like I felt this, or I, I saw this, or I saw, I had a vision of this. It was, it looked like a dream, but it was so real. And you can have other people, they have similar instances. And so immediately you have cohesion immediately you feel like you're part of something bigger than just yourself. And that in itself is so motivating to people because we're just done being shoved to the side. We're done being discounted. We're done with people saying that's just woo woo. It's not, it's truth. Yes. It's true. yes. It's and true. it was received really, really well. And I'm looking forward to helping more people find their truth. Absolutely. Well, we left off, um, on part one and again if you missed part one I will put that in the description box below so you can you don't necessarily have to watch it first but I would suggest watching it first because we start to introduce some of these ideas and we're going to focus today on the crisis point and and we talked a lot about walk-ins um last week and so again I don't want to rehash all that so if you missed that go and go and rewatch that uh so you understand what we're talking about and I told you guys that I would start with my crisis what happened to me um when I was a teenager and that's around the time that Magdalene started, I started to hear Magdalene. And um, I said last week that I started, uh, when I was born, my heart stopped in the womb. So that could have been considered one as well, but I don't have any recollection of before that. So, but I do have recollection of before this incident that happened to me. Now I've always been able to see spirits. I've always been the weird kid. I've always been very sensitive to the other side. <laughs> I think both, I think I think we're at a club here. I think that's everyone's like, oh, same these, same these. <laughs> Me too, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, we all have the same freak flag. We yeah, all wave. <laughs> yep, yep. So you know, and I was always very sensitive uh, child. And again, I don't know if that was because my heart had stopped, and I'd you know before I came into this world. I don't know if that's because I'm Rh negative. I don't know if it's just something I was destined to be able to see. I don't know. Maybe it's a combination of, of, of all of those. I, maybe it's the perfect storm. But I went to, so I grew up in a very um, kind of hoity-toity society. Very um, uh, old money, as they would say down here in South. Old, old money, big family names. My, my first name, Bryce, is my mother's maiden name. That's a big thing to do. Um, the Bryce's of South Carolina. It's a big family in South Carolina. My mom's family. They're all doctors. Uh, the University of South Carolina, the Williams Bryce Stadium. That's my family that built that stadium, the medical school. Uh, we laugh, my cousins and I laugh, that there are portraits of our relatives all over hospitals. We don't even know half the time that that's our great uncle. You know, so that's kind of the family I grew up in, you know. And I, so I'm uh, many generations of private schools. Uh, and I was in, I was in a very hoity toity private school. And, um, so I was expected, I was being conditioned and groomed basically to put, use a big word to go to university. I did not know that university was a choice. I thought that you by law had to go to university. I just didn't realize that was the law of my parents' house, not government law. Right. Um, and so that's kind of the, the trajectory that I was being pushed in. I, you know, in the society that I grew up in, women are expected to get uh, an education, but are not expected to use it. Mm -hmm. You get the education so that you can be, um, so that when you entertain, 
you know how to entertain your husband's colleagues and you get your MRS degree. You MRS degree. <laughs> um, yep. You get your Mrs. degree. And, um, you know, and then you get married and you have your house and your husband continues to contribute to the family name. And you typically don't work as a woman. You, 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 you know, you're, you're the lady of the house, which is fine. If that's the life you want to live, it's totally fine. But that's kind of where I was. Be I had a lot of anxiety as a child. There was a lot. I was around a lot of narcissism. Um, I, I was around a lot of stressed out kids. Now, looking back at my um, friends I grew up with especially for the boys that I grew up with. Like I, I have a lot of empathy for them that they had, a, they had far more pressure on their shoulders at a very young age than I did to carry on that family legacy. And, um, and so I was looking, I, I had considered going to, I had a college advisor from the time you entered high school, you had college advisors and I, I was, they were pushing me towards different uh, subjects that I excelled in, like going to law school at one point that was preparing me for law school. Although I would have never used that degree again. Um, or, uh, I was, my grandmother was a very gifted pianist as, as was I, and I won a lot of competitions as, as a kid. And, um, Juilliard was mentioned. My grandmother actually put a stop to that though, because she said it would stress me out too much, which she was right. My, my cool grandma, the one that lived, believed in reincarnation, <laughs> she was the one that I was like, that's a little stress because she yeah. was the pianist. Um, so anyway, that's kind of where everything was headed for me. And I'll never forget, I was sitting in my chemistry class, my sophomore year of high school. So I was, you know, for those who are not in the United States, I was 15 going on 16. That's the age. I never, I'll always remember I was sitting right behind John Perry. I, I, I remember what he had on. I remember what I had on. I remember what the teacher was teaching. And all of a sudden, my vision kind of went wonky. And it was all of a sudden like I was in a fishbowl. Like nothing was clear. Like everyone started to kind of get hazy. And I'm 15, so I'm like, whatever. So I keep going about my day. The next day I woke up still feeling a little bit weird. And that uh, afternoon I was go, I was not go. We had assigned after school activities. We couldn't leave the campus until like 530 in the afternoon. But I, my mother was picking me up early for, I can't remember why. So I went to the dean's office and signed out and I was waiting for my mom. And my mom was looking at me. She goes, you, you don't look like you feel well. And I said, I don't. But I didn't have a fever. There was no signs of anything. Well, I, I started to lose a lot of energy. And at that time, I was a cross-country runner. And so my, my parents were concerned. They didn't know what was going on because, again, I wasn't showing signs of any type of sickness. I was just very weak. And so they made uh, they talked with my cross-country coach and I wasn't going to run anymore but I was going to go and watch the meets and like go and support the team. And so we had gone to Westminster, which is a school here in Atlanta that we were big competitors with. And I remember watching my friends running this cross country meet and not being able to stand up, just like having mm -hmm. to sit down in the grass. And I remember watching bugs crawling all over my legs because it's the fall in Georgia and it's hot as hell and they're bugs and not even caring that these bugs were crawling over my legs. So I get back to school. My mom picks me up and my mom's very concerned at this point that like something's not right. And so she says to me, I'm going to have you sleep in tomorrow. We're going to have you do a half day. I'll, I'll call your school. And so I slept in. My mother was not there at the time when I woke up. My dad was there, though. And I went to take a shower and there was a lump, a huge lump under my armpit, like a golf ball. Now, at 15, I thought I had breast cancer because <laughs> I didn't know what that was. So I begged my dad. I wouldn't tell my dad, but I was like, Dad, you need to take me to mom. My mother was at my sister's school at that time doing something with the parents. And I pulled my mom and I showed her this like lump, like huge lump in my armpit. And my mother recognized it as a lymph node, that something was inflamed in my lymph nodes. And so she said, right, OK, we're going to go to the doctor now. So I went to the pediatrician. They immediately sent me to an infectious disease doctor because that's where they check for things like mono at that point. Mm -hmm. Not the mono test came back negative. Everything came back negative. Well, the swelling got so big that I couldn't put my arm down. And so my dean of students, who is still a good friend of my, my parents and follows me on Instagram to this day, told my mom that I, I needed to stay home because if I can't get my arm down, that that's going to be pretty painful. And so I went home. I stayed home for a couple of days. Well, then the next armpit, my left nose swelled up. So I'm like this. They're not going down. I keep going. My mom keeps taking me back to the doctor. They're getting concerned because if the lymph nodes aren't going to go down, they might have to surgically come in and, and actually fix it. Then I get them in my groin. Then I start getting all these lymph nodes, inflammations all over my body. 
everywhere there's a lip node, it was swollen. They are sending me at this point to almost every doctor you can think of, every specialist you can think of to try to figure out what is going on. Every test they're running is coming up negative. No mono. They tested me um, for everything. And I'll, I'll get deeper into that in a, little, in a little bit. At the same time, my parents, because they didn't know what was going on with me, but I was the doctors were very concerned. I was getting very sick. I was losing a bunch of weight at the same time. My temperature, my resting temperature is around 96. Uh, as an RH negative, that's normal. I dropped to 92. So doctors were very concerned. There was many times where I was actually rushed to the emergency room and for observation because my body temperature was dropping low. But they could not figure out what the hell was going on with me. And so they worked it out with my school where the school, thank God I was in a private school situation because the, it, they could send the work to the hospital or to my house. And I didn't necessarily, and I could be counted as being there, as being in attendance without actually, so I, I was doing, which taught me a lot because I got all my schoolwork done in like one hour, even right. six. So that shows you how much dead time they have at school, right? Um, and so anyway, I kept getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And I remember like seeing the look on my parents' face that they were petrified. They didn't know what was happening to me and no one could figure it out. I just looked like I was dying. Um, I ended up having spinal taps to chest uh, test for meningitis. For I was tested for all sorts of cancers. Um, I was tested for diabetes. Everything you can think of, they were just pulling to see what was going on, and everything came back negative. It was always negative, which I'm grateful it was negative. And then the most wild thing happened. I started waking up with scratch marks all over my body my mom called them rashes and she would take me to the doctor and be like what are these rashes that are appearing all over you know her we this is a new symptom what what is this and the doctor at first was like i think she's scratching herself and my mom was like no she's not she's too sick so my mom and my dad started staying up all night watching me sleep, monitoring me to see if I was and I wasn't scratching myself. Around this time as well, I started to lose feeling in my arms and my legs. I would wake up screaming in the middle of the night. My parents would have to come into the room and literally punch my arms and my legs to get feeling back into them. Like I was being pinned down and drained. And then my mother took me back to the doctor and she was like, she's not scratching herself. These are some crazy rashes. She's losing feeling in her arms and legs. What is happening to my child? And the doctor looked into my eyes. And the minute he looked into my eyes, he saw that there were also scratch marks in my eyes that he knew I could not have done myself. And he, I remember he said, I have no idea what's happening. No idea. Wow. So over time, I eventually just got better. I just got better over time. But I was changed after that. At that point, I started to see spirits even more clearly. I started to hear things, uh, Claire Audio, hear things. I started to have psychic knowledge. I would freak my friends out because this was back in the day before there was like caller ID. And I would know, I would be at my friend's house and I'd say, oh, I would know exactly who was calling us. The phone was ringing. Right. I would freak my friends out. I started to smell things that weren't there. So like uh, once one, I started to smell a cigar at one point and I was looking around and Someone was like, oh, my God, my granddad smoked cigars, but he died a while ago. I was like, well, I'm smelling it. So anyway, that changed my perspective of life in a very subtle way. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going to school in the UK and I ended up living in Los Angeles for a while. And around this time, I started to find yoga. And I started, I, this is when I started reading books on reincarnation, all that kind of stuff. And I had heard Magdalene speaking, but I wasn't like advertising it. Like, you know, when you're like 22, you're not like, guess what, guys? I can see shit. No, like you, you just want to go on right. dates and like be normal, right? But I started going to more tarot card readings and like doing spiritual healing. And then every single time I went, they would say, holy shit. You went through a shamanistic um, leveling up, basically. What happened to you when you were a kid, when you were a teenager? And they, it always come up in these readings. And I didn't want to talk about it, especially if I was there with a friend. I just did not want to talk. I was like, oh, yeah, I was just sick as a high school student. You know, Mah. they're like, no, you weren't sick. That's not what this was. This was like a leveling up. This was like, a, and it was a, for, we call it, it was for me, it was a crisis, moment of crisis, because it was taking me off the path. 
It literally took me off the path and put me, and that is part of why I ended up in India for so long, why I'm on YouTube talking about these things. And, um, and that is when I, again, I started hearing Magdalene. And at that point, like, like I said, before that happened, I would see spirits, hear spirits. But after that happened is when I started to get physically sometimes assaulted by yeah. the bad ones, which I've, I've, I've showed pictures before of the bruising and the scratching and all that kind of stuff. And so um, that's kind of was my crisis point where I physically, my, my body, something happened with my soul because my body temperature dropped to 92. I mean, Nicole's a nurse. She could maybe speak on that, but that was a panic for the med. When my body temperature started to drop, normally when someone's sick, what happens? It goes up. Yeah. Mine was well, going down. It's one of two things, usually in a traditional illness, either the temperature spikes or it does drop. And when the, the temperature drops, it's usually a sign that it's actually more severe. It's more chronic to have a lower temperature than a higher temperature. The higher temperature is usually in the in the earlier stages of whatever you're seeing. But um, yeah, are you are you finished with that? I don't mean to rush you. I just no, no that. That was kind of like story. Say. Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Keep going. Go. Um, <laughs> it's definitely, it was definitely a soul event. Um, and I, I want to just preface it. When I say a crisis event, that's my term. That's a Nicoleism. You know, like I've learned as I've gone through this journey, you know, there's just certain things that's very hard to put 3D words on because it's really, really hard to, um, it's hard to encompass what's actually happening. But um, there is such thing as a as a soul crisis, and your your physical form, as Bryce has said many times, you know, you have the Shiva and the Shakti, and so your her soul was in a battle long before the symptoms started to show in her physical form. But in in the physical, when people started to notice, and she started having the symptoms, was whenever you know decisions were being made on a soul level, you know, for her. And uh, first of all, she, she had a, she had a support team. She had people that were always there to help her, but as universal law and celestial law, you can have a support team and you can have a bunch of angels that are there waiting. If you don't call them in and you don't know to call them in, they're not going to intervene until it is a crisis. And then they're going to intervene on your greatest good in a very minimal way, like the, the smallest way possible, because you have free will. So a lot of times people go through things in life and they go, you know, nobody ever helped me, you know, if God's real and how come, how come I was allowed to go through that? Well, first of all, you know, we do have trials that we have to go through to learn certain lessons, but also on a conscious level, you have to be accepting of the assistance that's being offered to you. So Bryce just illustrated why, and, and I know I grew up in the South, you know, a lot of people that are in that type of environment, they walk the walk, but they really don't have faith. They're the most empty vessels when it comes to true faith. When some, a crisis really happens, they look at each other and they go, what's going to happen? You know, like, do you think so-and-so went to heaven? Cause you know, he did so he did this and he did that, you know, like mm -hmm. it's very, very, um, non spiritual, you know, yeah. it's religious. And they do all the things, but it's not. Mm -hmm. so they don't have that core belief where they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that soul is, you know, is, is ascending, is rising. And so if her soul was going through the battle. It was going through it. It was feeling all the things. But her conscious was slowly tapping in, right? And then when shit got really, really real, they came in and they assisted. And so she did level up. I personally have had that happen too. And it, to me, it felt like, like I felt completely at peace with the fact that I wasn't going to physically be on this planet anymore. And that acceptance, that lack of attachment to the things and the people and that knowing that there's something beyond this experiment as a, in a, a earthly experiment in itself gives you a leveling up on your soul because you are, you are not in the heavy dense matrix that you're attached to. So Bryce went through that on a soul level for a long time and then it manifested in her physical form. And then 
because of the environment that she was in, she wasn't, you know, um, she, besides her one grandmother, everyone else was really, you know, doing the, the religious walk. Mm -hmm. And I think that really does people a disservice that really want to tap into their spiritual life because of all the fear and all the, all the misinformation around it. And you know, they make it seem like you're, you don't fit in. If you believe that you have to believe what we believe. And so again, when a walk-in occurs, it's usually a crisis event. And, and uh, the, the characteristics that you'll see is that person comes through whatever it is, and they have a wiser countenance. They have a spiritual knowing. They have esoteric knowledge. They, or they have a, an unquenching thirst for these things. And they're going to go on these life journeys that prior to that, this event would have never presented themselves to them. It would have never been a part of their plan. But now they can't fathom their life without it. So for Bryce, it was going to India. You know, no one in her family understood why she had to go to India, but she knew in her soul that this is what she needed to do. Yeah. Right. And I don't I think say, I'm thinking. Uh, no. And I think there is a deeper because even though that was awful as a teenager to go through, it's so complicated because and uh, Kim Tesla has spoken about this on her channel. The school that I went to is an Illuminati school. Um, it is very expensive. It was a very it's a very it's one of the top 10 boarding schools in the nation. And I have my suspicions. I think, in my opinion, there was definitely SRA happening at that school. I think I was a target. And that event also saved my life. Mm -hmm. It yeah. put my yeah. life in crisis, but it saved my life too. Because it got me out and in the hospital and with my parents. Okay, I know there are people watching that don't know what SRA is. I don't know if you can say I, all the words. I can't say it, but I can I um I will have you guys. It's satanic practice. Okay. It's a yeah. So, mm -hmm. we can't say all the words on YouTube, That's but treatment. <laughs> I, I had somebody it, ask the question on the last one. So, yes, so that's why it is, I pointed um, that out. It is religious okay. practices of the satanic kind. There you go. That are um, <laughs> that involve mistreatment of a soul. Of a of usually a of a, of a, of a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, I have a specific blood lineage. I know that. And I think that, you know, DeSantis, Governor DeSantis was at, was a teacher at my school at one point. Everybody loved him. And I've been told that there was a reason why he was there. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and it wasn't, it was for good. It was to help with the situation. Um, I have been told, I'd still to this day, when I drive through that campus, my stomach turns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I don't, I am, I am not a person of destruction, but if I had to pick one place in the whole world that I could burn down, it would be that school. I have a close friend here that went there and she's had all kinds of mental issues. Oh. I have not talked to her in a, in a while, but um, yeah. yeah um, a, a, abuse through the, I mean, yeah. when I look back at my, you know, a lot of people look back at their high school experience and they think about like the mean kids, all that kind of stuff. That's mm -hmm. not what the kids I went to school with. We were surviving together. I have mm -hmm. no bad memories of any of them. The teacher is only, let me give you guys an example. So the day I had a spinal tap. So when I, around the time that I had the spinal tap done, I was going to one class a day. We had, at this point, I had, we, we had worked it out to try to get me going. So I'd go to one class a day and I'd rotate them. And my parents would have like weekly meetings with my teachers. So they were very involved. The school was trying to help me get through my work. I had tutors that would come to the house as well. And when I had my spinal tap done, um, they didn't tell me uh, as a child, as a 15 year old, they didn't tell me, which I, I, I understand that that's a really scary thing to have to go through. Although it really wasn't that bad. I look back, I'm like, it wasn't that bad. Um, and when they, when they, at least in the nineties, when this was happening, what they do, you guys is they, for those who don't know what that is, is they, they numb your back with lidocaine and they stick a very, like an epidural type needle into your spine and they, with, they pull spinal fluid out. And when they're looking in the fluid to see what's what's going on. And when you have the spinal tap done, at least back in the 90s, you had to lay down for a while after the procedure 
so that your body could reproduce. And they, they, they were bringing me Sprite. That's all I remember. They kept bringing me Sprites and I had to like lay there. Um, the procedure itself did not hurt at all because you were numb. Like the only thing I felt was the prick of the, the needle for the lidocaine. Well, because I was so young, and I think because I was a small 15 year old, 100 pound kid, um, it took me a, a couple of days to really get full feeling back in my legs. And so the day after I had the spinal tap, my parents decided like, we're not going to send her to school today. We're going to let her just kind of relax and let her body, you know, I had been through a lot at this point. I'd been poked and prodded. And, um, and so the day after that, I went back to, I took both Spanish and French and I would, my mother would drive to the school and she, for the class I was taking, I would go in and I would get there like five minutes early so I could set up before everyone rushed in. So I wasn't pushed in the hallway or anything. And then after the bell would ring, the teacher would usually let me leave five minutes early so I could get to my mom's car before the rush of students as well. Because most of the teachers were very aware of the delicate situation that I was in health-wise. And a few of the teachers that weren't psychopaths actually would get emotional when I would come to their class and they would sit and ask me if I was, because they had children themselves. And so I can look at looking back, you know, my parents didn't know if I was going to live or die. You know, they didn't know what they were dealing with. Or is their kid going to be diagnosed with leukemia? Like, what what's happening? And so I think some, some of my teachers did have that, tapped into that, and were very emotional about the fact that my life could possibly be at stake. Well, the Spanish teacher, who now is in federal prison for being, um, for mistreating young ones, we'll say, um, I got get to his class. I'm sitting in the desk. He's there at his desk, and he waits for all the students to get in. And he says to me, he goes, you missed a Spanish test. You were supposed to be here yesterday for a Spanish test. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. I thought my parents called. I, I had a spinal tap. And so I couldn't come. I couldn't come. And he said, you really think you, you are more important than my Spanish test? Yeah. My daughter deals with that at her school, too. One of the what the top, top public school in the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got in the car. <laughs> I told my mom, I got in the car, I was like, I was about to say, I'm not going to say his name. I was like, he, <laughs> he, he told me that, that the Spanish test was more important than my spinal mm -hmm. tap. And my mom mm -hmm. got so pissed. She called my dad. My dad marched on that school. They ripped me out of that class so fast. I think my dad probably said some things. And my dad and I don't have a relationship to this day. But to tell a child that a fucking Spanish test is more important than their life, that's that's narcissism. And that's what I was dealing with continually at that school. Um, mm -hmm. That school since has had a lot of lawsuits filed against them from kids that were older than me, a few years older than me, that were assaulted. <clears throat> um, it was, it's a terrible school. And I will never, and I remember even as, even before I got sick, like as, as a kid thinking like, you know, most of these kids at this school are, are lineage. They're many generations. Like my dad went to the school, you know, like, their business as a private school really depends on the experience the child has at the school and whether or not they'll send their kid there. Right. So they're not, I remember thinking they're not doing really good marketing strategies because I fucking hate this place. My freshman year of high school. So the guy who wrote the book deliverance, which is the movie, they have a big movie. He went to that school. And at that time, uh, like when my dad went there, it was an all boys school. When I was a freshman in high school, somebody had found this letter that he wrote back to the Alumni Association. They, they photocopied it and put it all over the, the uh, student lounge area. They had sent him a letter requesting money for the Alumni Association to donate to the school. And the guy wrote back a seething letter about how his time at that school was the worst experience in his whole entire life. He had never experienced as much abuse as he did at this school and don't ever contact him again. And somebody photocopied that and threw it all. I, so I know other students were having the same experiences and wanted to like wake other people up. Of course, if this was happening now, I think it would have gone out more publicly. But when I was a kid in the nineties, it was us just trying to survive together. Like basically look at this letter. We're not crazy. We're being yeah. abused. We're being, I mean, the amount, I can't even like uh, going back through trauma therapy, of course, issues with my thought. I mean, there, it, it just compounded itself. And so this was a crisis moment okay. for the trajectory of what I understood life to be. But in the same breath, it saved my life. Yeah. It, spirit allowed it to happen because it removed me from a possibly deadly situation. Yeah. Um, 
if that makes sense. And, um, and I remember like when I at the sickest I was, I remember the house I grew up in our, we had, you know, the living room, the fancy living room and like the family room. And I remember laying on the sofa and like we had a big screen TV back when big screens were like boxes. <laughs> um, and I remember watching TV laying there and I remember thinking, this is so much better than being in school, like being sick right now, not yeah. knowing if I have cancer or not is way better than being in school. Like that's sad. That's a sad, mm -hmm. if your child is, is more comfortable not knowing if they have cancer than actually being in school, then there, there's a problem. Yeah. So well, a, and I, I'm sitting here thinking of, of it in a, in probably a little bit more of a macro kind of way because I didn't experience what you experienced, but I'm putting all these pieces together, you know, and, and, and so um, from a top down mentality, they are, they, the institutional practices are no matter whether they're private, Catholic, public, whatever, they are doing their very, very best to break and fracture these little souls to push them into whatever direction they want them to go in and only the ones that have that inner strength that have that inner knowing that have that that fractal of of gold weaved through them from source is going to be able to fight that there's going to be able to have the strength to fight that and so now you think about we, we we've all heard about you know there's people that first of all there's there's souls that that cannot live here and they tap out and they leave. So a soul can leave a body and not have another soul walk in. They just are then organic mm -hmm. beings. They have everything that they, they require to have a pulse and a heartbeat and, and function, but they don't, they're not real. They're not, they don't have the capacity to be a real spiritual person. They're just hollow. Some people refer to them as NPCs or soulless or whatever. Um, so, how many people do you know went through things like that and they came out zombies in life? I can't help but think that that, you know, that's that little fractured soul was just removed from that. That was the the contract, you know, expired. That's all that they had to. I said that the other day, like you, you can contract a life of lessons of hardship, but it's only to a certain point. And then you're going to be taken out of that. And depending on on things, you may or may not like if your trajectory of this this human isn't to have a spiritual mission or whatever, then you're just going to the, the human just lives whatever life is left until they until they die. And and the strong are going to be have the will to survive and go a different direction and fight the darkness and go uh, to the light. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Yeah. It, remi it makes me really think about I've, I've been doing this over and over and over and over again. So I, you know, I worked at a bank. Um, it's how I got to know all the, the old Athens uh, money folks. Yeah. <laughs> and I got really sick. I'm not going to go into my whole story right now because I think it'll just go too long for, for this, for this episode. But um, I got really, really sick in like 1995, six, um, couldn't walk very well, like couldn't wear shoes. Like it was, it was really, really bad. I had to quit my job at that bank and I was there 11 years. I was like, I love that, that job and all. But when I look at it now, I'm like, okay, yeah, I needed to get out of that. My soul needed to get out of that, uh, mm -hmm. that corrupt mm -hmm. place, you know, it's banking. And, and again, the the body is going to illustrate what the soul is feeling. You know, well, then I then I, you know, start my pickle company. And then I'm, you know, I'm speaking in DC. I mean, just things I never thought I would do, you know, just crazy. Now you know. you're on YouTube with us. <laughs> yeah. I'm so famous. I'm so so smart. But and then I had my store and it was doing great until I got sick. I got sick again. And it attacked my, the, the inflammation that I used to have all over my body ended up just going here around my aorta and then the, um, around my eyes. So giant cell arteritis. And so, I mean, this all, this eyesight thing 
was very quick. It happened. It started in 2019 and I mean, been steadily going blinder and blinder and blinder. But, um, I, so I closed my store December 31st, 2019 and people still like ride by it and go, where are you? Like, I mean, like whatever, but you know, but, but I'm seeing that too. Like that was like my identity for a while, you know, and that's, that was just, you know, well, and that, that me off that the path upward. I feel yeah, like that is that that sacred geometry, you know, like if you don't learn the lesson the first time around, it's going to yeah. come back around. It's going to yeah. keep presenting itself. And I know I have similar things. I kept saying, like, what is it that I'm not learning? Like, what is it? Am I missing here? And, it, you know, source like, don't worry, it's going to come back around. I'm going to give you another opportunity to realize this lesson that I keep giving you. And mm -hmm. then eventually or not, <laughs> you learn the lesson. You know, if you don't, then you carry it with you to your next life. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's just regional magazines, but I'm thinking now like over there in the cabinet right over there, I have lots, I've got a stack of magazines that they wrote stories about me. They called me a local uh, legacy, like all this stuff, you know, and I'm thinking, I don't really care about any of that. That's all part of your story. It's all part of it. It all brings you. That's the beautiful thing Ram Dass says in one of his books that, you know, things happen to us and, and in the moment we don't know why they're happening. But after they've happened, we can turn around and look back at our life and see exactly why they happened and see exactly, mm -hmm. I mean, with my sickness, there's no way. I mean, I'm telling you guys, and I know that I'm the only one that really knows this, but my, I would not be sitting here on YouTube right now talking to you guys if that event had not happened when I was 15 years old. Right. And when my site went, when everything, that was almost like when the flip went, all right, it's go time. That was almost yeah. like that marking of the beginning of a whole new trajectory. And what happens is, is the understanding of the brain. I think you're right, Nicole. That's when the crisis comes in because my soul knew my soul was probably very, very much at peace, but my brain had been programmed to think of life in a certain way. And I've, I've said this before, my life trajectory, what I've done as an adult, I, there's no one in my family I can go to for advice. Because I have taken the the Robert Frost poem, I have taken the the, the path path less traveled by. You know, I don't have the four hundred one k in the corporate job. I haven't I haven't had that since I started going to India. But I keep just following where my soul is telling me to go, and it's it's provided an incredible experience thus far. And it's giving. And, and you're right, Nicole. I think that there are those kind of moments are make or break for a lot of people and they either come out um gone or stronger and more yeah. and more determined than ever you know and i hopefully i think that's the path i took was coming out stronger and more determined to to uh and i i you know when i was 12 years old three years before this all happened i remember getting in my mom's car at middle school and thinking what do you do all like looking at my mom thinking like i don't want this life yeah. I don't, what do you do? What do you do all day? Like that's like I remember thinking, like making a very distinct decision in my twelve-year-old brain that I didn't want to be like my mom. No offense, mm -hmm. I love my mom and she loved her life, but I didn't want that. Mm -hmm. I didn't want that. I to me that was like made my stomach turn. I was like, I don't want that life. So, so it was like that. That decision was made at twelve, and then three years later, a flip happened, and it put me on a different path that has been scary because I don't have an experience. I don't, there's no, you know, for where I grew up, all my friends, all their parents, there's a formula that works and yes. they follow this formula. Yes. But I rejected that. And so I'm creating yeah. my own formula and just trusting every, just trusting the universe has led me again to this moment, this pinnacle moment right here, talking to you ladies that I would have never met if that, Mm -hmm. event had happened at 15 years old if that yeah. makes sense yeah totally. and i think that i think you can you can replicate that in many 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 lives you know for i was doing all the thing i, I was checking all the the boxes on the on the checklist of success right but all this bad shit kept happening right and i and i was like why do th why does this stuff keep happening i just don't understand I'm doing all the things I have all the degrees I'm, I'm uh, you know like if you looked at me from the periphery it's all this success but within there was just all this chaos mm -hmm. and it because there wasn't peace 
that what there was an imbalance there. And I felt like the more I gave, which is a very, very true statement, I didn't have any idea at the time, the more I gave, I felt like it was my my duty to just give it all, just give all the care to all the patients, give everything to my kids, give everything, everything, everything away. Never, ever, ever expecting it to be returned to me, not knowing the damage I was doing to myself by not taking care of my own spirit, my own soul, loving myself, giving myself compassion and kindness, healing my own wounds. You know, so that's where you, you finally, I feel like speaking for myself, I won't speak for anyone else. You get to a certain point and you just can't fit any more boxes in the closet of shit that you have, that you have packed away your whole life. And you're like, well, well, I've moved on so many times. I guess I need to go through and deal with all this stuff, you know, because for a long time, putting one foot in front of the other, getting the next job, getting the next promotion, moving on, doing this, whatever, that was success, right? And then I got to a certain point where I'm like, I have done all the things and I have less than I did when I started. So why was I on that hamster wheel? Like, why have I been killing myself? Why have I given everything away? Because I was giving all my power away and and felt compelled to do so, you know? So it, people do get to that aha moment where it is make or break. And I feel it is soul driven. And it is whether you have a connection, a spiritual connection that you, you truly have faith in, or have you just been pretending to have a connection and you actually have no faith in it at all. And you don't know what you're going to cut, what you're able to do until you try. I personally would rather try and fail than not try. But a lot of people don't have that makeup. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing, too. You hit on something that I think is really important um, that we understand, especially as women. Martyrdom is a service to self. Mm -hmm. It's a negative polarity. And so Nicole said something really important. We give, we give, we give, we give. And I think women have been trained to do that. Give to your kids un unconditionally. Give to your husband. Give, 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 give. Well, if you're not getting back in return, then you're on a negative path. Okay. You know, I just had that conversation with uh, Catherine Edwards. Uh, I know this is airing on Friday. This episode that I just did with her aired Thursday, where we talked about, you know, sponsorships. Like uh, people... You know, most of those subscribers are really supportive about sponsorships. And uh, Nicole's about to do sponsorship with us uh, as well. And but we get a few people that comment really nasty things about us taking yeah. sponsorships. But that's because people have been conditioned to believe martyrdom is good when martyrdom is, is a negative. That is a demonic polarity. It's satanic to martyr yourself. So and we get that in the yoga world. People expect us to teach for free. Well, how am I going to keep the lights turned on in the shawl if I'm teaching for free? You know, so you expect me to teach you in the morning for free and then go work a full-time job and just be a slave to you? Just be your dancing monkey? Like, that is martyrdom and it's negative. It's a selfish. It's not a selfless. Um, and somebody commented this. It was beautiful. Yes, taking care of yourself is service to others. Yeah. It is service to others. So if you're know. the type of person that thinks you have to give and give and give and give and you're doing the right thing, you're only doing the right thing if you're getting back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I have that, I have that conversation with countless people every single day because they find themselves the exact same scenario. I just trans, you know, described to you and they're at a loss. They're like, but I don't understand. And I'm like, you're been ignoring your body and you've been ignoring your, your own soul, your own spirit for how long, you know? And so your inner child, is screaming for attention your children have everything your your children and your husband probably have too much and there you are with the crumbs of life like that is not in service of others you have nothing to give i don't know what you're giving to them but it is not authentic because mm -hmm. you have vapors left in your soul you have to go back and love yourself enough to heal yourself to address the wounds, to understand why you run from things, to understand why you stay so busy, that escapism mentality that I'm so busy, I can't take care of myself. Well, there's a problem. There's a problem. And your life is going to continue to be chaotic and have fires here and fires there and little bombs going off because you're not taking care of the center. You're not taking care of the soul. 
Right. Even just be taking my little walks. <laughs> yeah, I think I posted yeah. I posted one this morning on my YouTube, but just or yesterday on my YouTube. But I I um even doing that, like in just sharing it, you know, with others, I'm like, it's so so silly that I'm like I think that I've got to record myself taking a walk, right? Well, it is something that I really, really, really need. And there was a lot of work I needed, I was supposed to be doing at the time. <laughs> but I'm like, you know what? The sun is shining right now. It might rain tomorrow. I am going to go take a walk and I'm going to show yeah. there are people stuck, you know, in a cubicle and maybe they can just like um, hide from their boss and like watch it real quick, you know, and escape from, from that world and see did, uh, an owl flew across while I was videoing. You can't make this stuff up. It was just like, everything just happens for um, a reason. But also afterwards, I, I cried a little bit, like after I finished, you know, like I was like, wow, I really needed that for myself. And yes, yeah. I did not get everything done that I was supposed to get done today. But there are people commenting on that video saying they really needed that, that yeah. it. So yes, it's service to me. Taking care of myself is service to others. So I'm, that's how I'm seeing this. So in yeah, my own and the law of one is very clear about that. Like martyring yourself is putting you on a negative polarity. Mm -hmm. It's not putting you on a positive one, but we have been conditioned to venerate martyrs. We've been conditioned, but we've been conditioned by people who know that that is a negative polarity. You know, I, I, I know, you know, right now for me, financially getting a massage isn't in the finances, but I know, um, Although Catherine Edwards, very sweet, sent me a, a gift card. So I'm very I'm excited to book it. <laughs> but like people, people who go and get massages and feel like they have to, to apologize for that. No, you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. And you're making that exchange yeah. with that massage therapist who's been a long time in school to be able to provide that service to you. There's an exchange yeah. of energy. People who get acupuncture or go get Reiki done or get healing, they think, oh, this is a luxury. No, it's not. If you can afford it, do it because that's how you're going to take care of yourself and you are also in and in, in the flip side because you are taking care of yourself again you're providing an opportunity for the service provider you're paying for an opportunity for them to be able to take care of themselves you've also made yourself more balanced and grounded so you can come home and be more attentive to your dependents you know it's it's um it's it's not selfish at all you know, yeah. it's, it's, um, we, we have to remember that, that we, you, you have to, it's like when you fly in the, the mac, oxygen mask, you put your mask on first before yeah. the person next to you. Yeah. Every now and again, I will, you know, have a, a flip moment where I fall back into those old habits, you know, and, and sources way of getting my intention to snap me out of that is he makes me feel like I have a sunburn. All of a sudden, my arms are like really hot, and I'm like, "You're right, <laughs> you're right." Like that is my old way of thinking. That is that is not going to serve me, and that is not going to get me a re the reward. That is not going to. So he pushes me right back on that path. Now, had I been, I'm sure I had the same guidance, but I was so involved in life and doing all the things before. To me, I was just like, oh, these hot flashes, you know, they're bad. But it, you get trained in your mind. If you're a female at a certain age, you're like, you know, all the things, all the signs, all the stuff that you're feeling, you get told, oh, that's just because you're this or that's just because you're that or whatever. It it may be, but it may also be that that guidance, that spiritual guidance of you're really falling off the path that's going to truly reward your soul. Pay attention to it. So now I'm like, yep, you're right. Thanks for that. Thanks for that little nudge. Let me straighten myself up again. And actually, I want all of our subscribers, all of our friends watching right now, I want you to put in the comment section one thing you do every day that's just for you. Yeah. And if you can't think of something to put, then there you go. There's your starting point. Mm -hmm. That could be like Angie just taking a walk. It could be putting music on and dancing for a few minutes. It could be taking a hot bath. That's what I love to do every night. I take a hot bath with Epsom salts and reading a murder mystery. You know, <laughs> what What do you do for you every day? Maybe you go and get a pedicure once a week. That's okay. If you can yeah. afford it, absolutely do it. It's reflexology on your foot. It's soothing for you. You're also supporting a local business. Yeah. 
And for me, like the bath thing, I try. I try. It's not my thing. I, I do try because I, you know, like detox baths and things like that. Like I'll do those things. And I'm like, when will the water finally cool off so I can get out of here? Because I feel like I'm wasting the hot water. I'm like, it's still hot. I've got things I want to do. Like I might want to write something. I, I do a lot of poetry that I don't really share with anyone else. But that's like, so I'm sitting in there going, oh, <laughs> and that's okay that might not work for, for me what that's always even when i was a child i'd be very upset my mother would just put me in a hot bath and it would calm me down yeah. so that's always been for me something that really works it might not work for you find out what you enjoy what do you yeah like? i'm like give me a window like just let me like sit and look out a window that's yeah. you know <laughs> yeah i do my meditation in the morning and then kind of helps me kind of center my my path for the day I take whatever comes along and then at night I do a uh, salt bath before I go to bed and kind of mm -hmm. detox the day away and start new again the next day. That's the same. I, I always do it right. Before. Well, I, I'm kind of, listen, bless all the men's heart who have ever shared a bed with me. <laughs> <laughs> I am very OCD about the sheets. And you ain't getting in my bed unless you cleaned your, your body off. Like, I don't <laughs> care if you took a shower this morning. You get in that shower and scrub. Luckily, my boyfriend's the same way. He will shower every night before bed, too. But that's part of it, too. It's like I calm my mind down. The salt, the hot bath helps me calm down. Oops. Yeah. And um, and then uh, and then it also <laughs> helps with my OCD about the bed being clean. <laughs> um, you know, uh, for, for, cause I, I do, that is one thing that I struggle with is OCD and cleanliness. I really do. That's something I have to work on is to allow things to be a little messy. Like I, you know, I, I, I have a hard time with allowing things to be messy. Um, I'm very, but I think a lot of that is trauma based from growing up in the environment that I grew up in. We know people with eating disorders, it's because they're trying to yeah. control something because they don't feel like they have any control. Same thing right. with like OCD and anxiety. It's like the OCD is trying to control your space because you've been under so much stress and, and yeah, and I, and I know, I know that my mom especially feels guilty about the things that we or I especially experienced in that school. And I totally understand that in that situation, that was the only option because maybe the local public school wasn't the best there. And that was a, a generational thing. So they were stuck between a rock and a hard place. And I don't know back then if parents knew, really knew what abuses were happening, happening. I mean, now that I mean, listen, my Spanish teacher isn't the only teacher I have that's now in federal prison. There's a couple of them that are in federal prison. So that was very validating. When you find out they got arrested and you're like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I can. Yeah. Talk, talk I, shocking. I had, but this is, a, this is as an adult, but I had a, a, a coworker that just made my skin crawl. Right. And everybody really like loved him. Right. And so I was just this, this oddball out. Right. And, but he seemed to be very, have these like predator type traits about him. And so <clears throat> I warned a couple of people that I felt like he was really preying on because they were much, much younger than him. And of course it ended up in a, in a complaint and we ended up with the, with the HR representative and the, you know, and the, <laughs> the union representative and all this, you know, whatever. And they wanted me to apologize. And I said, I'm not going to apologize because that is what my gut is telling me mm -hmm. whether I am proven to be right or not I, I feel it in my soul and we can just agree to disagree and I steer clear I continue to steer clear of so we ended up leaving that job shortly after <clears throat> and about a year later uh ex coworker sent me a message and she was like look at the newspaper the online newspaper for this city and so I did and he was across the front page and he had been charged with um pilfering drugs from the ER and he was taking them to his house and using them on his children and their and their friends and filming awful things and um he's, he's in federal prison and I was like you know that 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 gut thing something to that you have to honor that feeling like when you really feel in your in the pit of your stomach that you should not be around someone it is for a reason that is that is source telling you get away, get away. It is not in your highest and best good. And so many people, I think it's different everywhere. My my context is really 
you know, in the South, we have this, we're like, you know, I have to go to so-and-so's Christmas party because it's expected of me, but I feel like my skin's crawling the whole time I'm there. And I'm like, well, it's probably because they're all a bunch of Satanists, <laughs> you know, yeah. like you should probably honor that and protect yourself and protect your spirit, your soul and your energy and not go. Yeah. You know, and, and it's like this, like, I could not go. <laughs> Yeah, you cannot go. You have free will of choice. I've stopped going. I mean, and and, and I'm real close to to a lot of the yeah. stuff I'm supposed to go do, family wise, community wise, whatever. And I'm just no. You're done, Z's. I'm yeah. done. <laughs> yeah, not. I'm not towing the line anymore. I'm going to take care of myself. And uh -huh. and that I always say that is your unapologetic boundary we have to as a people get to where we're comfortable taking care of ourselves and understand that it's not selfishness and be unapologetic about it like don't say i'm gonna go get a massage today because i just i need it and i know it sounds bad of me like don't give an apology for the one thing you decided to do for yourself don't apologize for it yeah. own it mm -hmm. own it i'm taking care of myself yeah because my body I'm me. Care of, yeah this is good for me yeah it's part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's a, we're coming up towards an hour. These things fly by so fast. I think that's a great section to li uh, leave it off with. I want to ask our, our subscribers if they have any questions about this stuff. I'm thinking next time we should talk about the organic portals and the humans that don't have souls. Yeah, because I I'm, when you just were talking about like, oh, it's because they might have been a bunch of Satanists. I want to know like, do these people know they're Satanist? <laughs> yeah, we can yeah, know. Yeah. We'll so. get into that. I've, I've got mm -hmm. another person coming on my show next week to talk about it. But we also want to talk about it with you guys too, because this is really important. And this is stuff they don't tell us. Um, mm -hmm. That we really should be understanding that not every human being actually has a soul, which is different from the psychopath. Psychopaths do have souls and they have decided to use them in a negative way. Organic portals don't. And it's 50% of our human population is an organic, meaning they don't have souls. They're just walking bodies. And we'll get into that yeah. next conversation. Um, well, and like in the food world, organic is like a really good word. So like, well, that's what the world one calls it. Yeah, <laughs> organic portals, meaning that, that they are, most organic portals are controlled by nefarious higher. Yeah. They don't, yeah. So we'll get into that next week, guys, next time. So um, yeah. anyway, any questions you guys have, let us let us know down in the comment section and let us know what you do every day. What's something you do every day to nourish yourself. And again, if you can't think of something. Now's the time to start. That's a sign <laughs> that take that as you, if you're looking for a sign, here's your sign. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, you guys, well, I'll put uh, both Angie and Nicole's channels will also be down in the description box below. So if you're not subscribed to them, please go get subscribed to them and we will all talk to you soon. Bye everybody. Bye.